Today, we will vote to advance four presidential nominations. First, we'll confirm Jane, James Cabal to be Under Secretary of Education. And we'll also confirm both da David Estudio and Angel Kelly to serve as district judges in Washington and Massachusetts, respectively. This afternoon, we will also advance the nomination of Ms. Veronica Rossman of Colorado, who has been nominated by President Biden to sit on the 10th Circuit Court of Appeals. Ms. Rossman has spent practically her entire legal career in public service as a, defend as a federal defender, giving a voice in the courtroom to those who often cannot afford legal representation. She's also an immigrant who f fled Russia with her parents as, as a child after her family endured anti-Semitic persecution in their home country. She understands personally the damage faced by those who endured discrimination. If confirmed, Ms. Rossman would be the only federal defender to sit on the Tenth Circuit, one of the few in the entire country. I am proud to have nominated Eunice Lee to the Second Circuit in New York, where she uh, now sits, and she too has been a federal defender. Um, we also have plenty of prosecutors and corporate lawyers wearing black robes. Like so many other of President Biden's judicial nominees, Ms. Rossman would bring a sorely needed perspective to our courts. The more we work to make our courts reflective of the diversity of this country, both demographic and professional, the more we will strengthen the public's trust in our judicial system. Now, secondly, today the Senate Democrats will also continue work to turn President Biden's Build Back Agenda into law, Build Back Better Agenda into law. It bears repeating, this is a historic effort. This is not just a simple another piece of legislation. We're laying the foundation for another century of American prosperity, just like the Great Society and the New Deal before it. Our legislation will bring transformational change to help build ladders so that those, in the, those can climb up into the middle class while making it easier for those already in the middle class to enjoy that middle class life and stay there. Too many in the middle class worry they're going to slip out with all the changes occurring in our society. We strengthen their ability to stay. And too many who are trying to climb those ladders find the ladders steep and unavailable. We're providing those ladders so they can get there too. It's strong, bold, important legislation. And it's really a privilege to be here in the Senate and consider something as strong and bold as this. Later today, our caucuses, uh, our caucus will discuss the latest elements of the reconciliation bill. Working with our colleagues in the House, we will have met the target date of September 15th set in the budget resolution for producing text to review. I expect our committee chairs will provide an overview of all the work that each of their committees has done over the last four weeks in drafting legislative text, and the entire caucus will have the chance to offer feedback so we can continue to move this process forward. This will continue to be a collaborative process. Everyone everyone is going to have input into this legislation. But of course, our unity is our strength. And if we're not unified with 50 votes, we can't get anything done. So we all must come together. Now, I'm pleased to say, after wait working weeks over the summer on our reconciliation bill, we are making great progress towards bringing the bill to the floor. Now, while Democrats are fighting to strengthen the middle class, our Republican colleagues, unfortunately, are resorting to the same tired, predictable objections they raise about practically any Democratic proposal. Rather than explain why they oppose supporting families, or expanding health care, or taking action on climate change, they've spent the last several months recycling old accusations about, quote, liberal wish lists. And rather than engage our policies on the merits and have a real debate, too often, they've raised unwarranted and incorrect points about how these programs will impact inflation. I remind my colleagues of a report le released not long ago by the chief economist at Moody's Analytics, Mr. Mark Zandi. When Mr. Zandi examined Democrats' two main legislative proposals, our infrastructure bill and our Build Back Better legislation, 
he concluded these packages would provide a massive boost to our economy. Specifically, he said, our program would, quote, lift the economy's longer-term growth potential and would lift productivity and labor force growth. That is, our proposal will do exactly what we say it will do, according to this impartial arbiter, Mark Zandi. And as for the Republicans' overheated rhetoric on inflation, Mr. Zandi dismissed such concerns as, quote, overdone, and said our two infrastructure bills are designed to ease, his words, inflation pressures. Let me repeat that. According to Moody's top economist, hardly a fervent liberal, the Democratic proposals will actually ease inflation pressures, not raise them. When you strengthen worker productivity, when you e increase supply chains, the push to inflation decreases, decreases. And he also says that in the long term, it would help grow our economy so that more Americans can get to and stay in the middle class. Compare that to the signature accomplishment that Senate Republicans pushed when they were in charge. A massive corporate tax break, a massive tax break for corporations and the wealthy that did little to help everyday Americans. And the, that's the difference between a Democratic majority and a Republican one. We're fighting to strengthen American workers and American families. Republicans seem only worried about protecting those at the very top. And in addition for those with inflationary concerns, we're going to pay for our proposal. The Trump tax cuts, which every Republican voted for, created a $2 trillion deficit. So let's be realistic here. Let's be honest here. The charges of runaway inflation are just wrong, especially when you consider we're paying for it when Republicans were so willing to do tax cuts for the rich without paying for them at all. Now, on another subject, I know one you care about a great deal, Mr. President, among many, many other things you care about a great deal, voting rights. All year long, Senate Democrats have committed to passing legislation to protect the most sacrosanct right in our democracy, the right to vote. On two occasions, Senate Democrats voted unanimously to begin debate in the Senate on this critical issue. And both times, Republicans formed a wall of total opposition against any progress on voting rights in the United States Senate. But Republicans' refusal to work with us is no excuse for not getting something done. So later today, my colleague, Senator Klobuchar, along with Senators Kane, King, Manchin, Merkley, Padilla, Tester, and Warnock, will be introducing the Freedom to Vote Act, a compromise voting rights bill that I intend to schedule a vote on in the very near future. To piece this bill together, I'm proud to have convened and worked with eight members of my caucus, four progressives and four moderates, in bringing this bill to, to fruition. The compromise proposal contains many of the important provisions of previous voting rights bills championed by Senate Democrats, particularly by my colleague, Senator Merkley. It will protect the right to vote, put a stop to partisan gerrymandering, and the scourge of dark money in our politics. Critically, the, elect the legislation also incorporates important feedback from election officials and includes new measures to promote greater voter confidence in our elections while stopping partisan election subversion. This is a good proposal, one that nobody in this chamber should, should oppose. My colleague, Senator Manchin, is working with Republicans to secure support, to secure support for the bill. And we look forward to hearing what changes they might make on legislation. I applaud Senator Manchin for his work here. He's always said that he wants to try and bring Republicans on. And now, with the support of Democrats in this compromise bill, which Senator Manchin had great input into, he can go forward in that regard. The fact of the matter is that this is, the fact of the matter is that this legislation is critical for stopping some of the most egregious assaults against voting rights happening at the state level. A few weeks ago, the governor of Texas signed one of the most sweeping voter suppression bills in the entire country. It comes on the heels of other restrictions sprouting across the country, from ending election day registration in Montana, limiting after-hour drop boxes in Florida, 
even making it a crime to give food and water to voters at the polls in Georgia. No one, no one can look at these restrictions with a straight face and say they have a legitimate purpose. They have only one goal. It's a despicable goal. It's a nasty goal, making it harder for younger, poorer, non-white, and typically Democratic voters to access the ballot. Republicans lost the election. Biden is president. I'm majority leader. Instead of doing what you're supposed to do in a democracy, win over the people you didn't win before, they're trying to stop the people who didn't vote for them from voting. That is autocratic, anti-democratic, small d, and not what America is all about. It's a new phase of what used to be called Jim Crow. The Freedom to Vote Act is a necessary step to put an end to these assaults on the franchise. As majority leader, it's my intention to hold a vote on this bill as soon as next week as I mentioned. Now, finally, on the debt ceiling. In the long history of our country, the long, long history, the United States has never defaulted on its obligations to pay its debts. The full faith and credit of the United States has been the bedrock of our country's economic prosperity, a spotless record that both parties have years, for years, have worked together to preserve. No matter who was president, Democrat or Republican, in the past, the other party always stepped up to the plate and said we can't let the country default. Most recently, when President Trump was in office, Democrats stepped up on three separate occasions to work with Republicans to suspend the debt ceiling and continue to ensure that the U.S. was able to pay its bills, even when there was a Democratic majority in the, Senate, in the House. We did not resort to hostage taking or proclaim that it was the other side's responsibility we simply knew that when it came to the debt ceiling, it was important to put aside political differences and act responsibly, no matter who sits in the Oval Office. We know that failing to raise the debt ceiling would be, as the Republican leader has said in the past when Trump was president and he was arguing that Democrats should join him, would be a disaster. Well, if anything, that's an understatement. Just yesterday, one top forecaster said that, quote, a failure to raise the debt limit would have serious negative consequences. So in the immediate future, we need to raise the debt ceiling again. As in previous instances, it must, must be a bipartisan endeavor. And the reason is simple. We have to get this done, but much of the recent debt we need to pay for was incurred during the Trump administration. In fact, President Trump nearly added nearly $8 trillion to the national debt. Five and a half trillion of which was since the last time the debt limit was suspended until Trump's final day in office. So in other words, five and a half trillion dollars of this debt is totally under Republican management in the sense, because Trump was the president and Speaker McC Leader McConnell was the majority leader. Democrats, they got, we got that, that, that's when the debt was, was created, with Republican votes. Lots of Republican votes. Both sides, led by a Republican Senate, as I said, incurred much of this debt. Senators from both parties overwhelmingly voted in support of the many laws that contributed to this obligation. So neither party can wash its hands of responsibility to pay the bills. McConnell keeps talking, Leader McConnell keeps talking about the new spending that Democrats have done. That's not this debt. This debt. Five and a half trillion was all under Trump and when McConnell was the majority leader. Spe leader McConnell was the majority leader. But some Republicans, recklessly, irresponsibly, so overwhelmingly politically, seem eager to push our economy to the brink of total to catastrophe by suggesting they will oppose any effort to raise the debt ceiling. And rather than urging his colleagues to immediately drop this reckless idea, the Republican leader, shame on him, seems to be giving it his blessing, if not promoting it. If the United States defaults on its debt, it will harm every single American in this country, including potentially those who rely on Social Security and the members of our military. The consequences would reverberate around the world, and it would cause irreparable harm to the global economy at a time when we're all working to lift ourselves out of a once-in-a-century pandemic. So any efforts to play nasty, 
political games with the full faith and credit of the United States is reckless, irresponsible, despicable. It could pose to permanent damage to the U.S. economy and is a complete non-starter. In America, when it's time to pay the bills, we do it without exception. I yield the floor. Note the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Ms. Baldwin. 